live broadcasting space. Your trust, loyalty, and unflinching contributions have been the reason that we continue to stand tall as Southwest's most listened to radio station. In this process, we have had the review of our programming and news content in a tailored way that is fit for the multiple purposes of education, information, enlightenment, entertainment, and positive agenda setting. Beyond our core culture of good quality programs, we have also identified developmental and action-backed broadcasting as a synchronon to achieving a better society. For instance, we have taken up as causes an advocacy to end female genital mutilation and cutting, better involvement for women participation in politics and governance, strengthening of the Office of the Citizens, ETC. All these have earned us respect, recognition, and partnership from reputable organizations such as Women in Business, WIMBYs, Nigeria Network of NGOs, and the first of its kind partnership with the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to inform you that Splash FM, you can clap. You can clap if you wanted to. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to inform you that Splash FM has elevated corporate social responsibility to an all-time high of 86,631,825 naira, almost double the previous year because of our firm belief in reciprocating kindness. This CSR boost is without prejudice to the huge investment on our annual marathon event, which, thanks to our sponsors, became truly a national event with more than 5,000 participants. The support we received from the great city of Ibadan Government agencies, security agencies, and the good people of this state cannot be overemphasized. From July 2017 till date, Splash FM devoted millions of Naira to programs like Story Story, Talk Your Own, Justice in Motion, Ijoba Ibile, and many more, aimed at public education and enlightenment. Again, worthy causes like advocacy for women participation in politics, ending of female genital mutilation, NBC lecture and SMEs spread through strategic hours of the day non-stop for 11 months were embraced. Splash FM, the integrity station, in the last one year renewed her commitment, both human and material, towards worthy projects whose effect will be best measurable in years to come. For instance, Book Splash is a program designed to help the reading culture in our society. We supported in no small measure events cutting across different sectors of sports and entertainment. For example, Lagelu Inter-Secondary School Relay Race, Para Awards, Afrima Award, Youth and Adolescent Seminar, and Magic Nights, amongst a, a few a, a lot of, of others. In conclusion, Splash FM remains profoundly grateful to our many customers in Oyo State, Lagos State and beyond, listeners, well-wishers, and critics alike. Indeed, without your unwavering support, maintaining high standards in news and programming would have been an impossible task. You are greatly appreciated. Even though it is impossible to reciprocate your love in full, we will be unwavering in giving our best to that which has sustained your confidence in us. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much, Ronke. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful one there. It's our golden voice. She is our golden voice. All right. Um, I'd like to inform you, it's a bit of an announcement, quickly, before we move on to the next item, to say to you that uh, this program that we are going on with is streamed live, streaming live on Facebook, our Facebook platform. It's also live on our YouTube channel, as well as our Instagram page, Splash FM 105.5. So you can reach us, you can listen live, watch us live. Everyone here is being seen live across the globe, across the ocean, via these three channels on Facebook, on Instagram, as well as on our YouTube channel. If you also tune to Splash FM 105.5, you can also listen to this program as it's going on right here at Trenchard Hall, University of 
Ibado. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we cannot go to the annual lecture. That's the next thing now, the annual lecture. But before we go to the annual lecture, please, we'd like to quickly listen to a goodwill message, a goodwill message from the State House. The government of Oyo State is already here, seated. So we'd like to hear a goodwill message from the State House. Let me welcome very specially the Deputy Governor of Oyo State, Chief Moses Alake Adeyemo. Put your hands together for him. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, because of time, please pad pardon me. I won't like to mention names as uh, Chief Oyiro has done, but I recognize everybody who is here, you know, in the name of the governor of Oyo State. Uh, I want to deliver the speech of His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Oyo State, Senator Abiola Jimobi or the occasion of the 79th birthday of our father, a philanthropist, a chairman of a very important radio station in Nigeria, and uh, somebody who is heavily known in the country. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I feel highly honored to be here this morning to present the address of the governor, the executive governor of Ohio State, Senator Abiola Jimobi. I'm happy to be part of this anniversary of the 79th birthday celebration of an elder statesman, Chief Bayo Akonde, a philanthropist, the Mayugun, sorry, Maye Ulubadan. Maye Ulubadan of Ibadan land. I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to say Maye Gun. You know, we have Maye Guns in Okyogun. And I believe that our father is also Maye Gun. So I'm sorry, sir. Maye of Ulubadan. The Maye Ulubadan of Ibadan land. Chief Adebayo Akande, sorry, my my distance, I can't see very well. Let me go to where I can see. Excuse me. I feel highly honored to be here today to be part of the activities marking the 79 birthday celebrations of an elder statesman, renowned industrialist, business guru, and a badam indigenous, the Maya Ulubano of Ibadan land, Chief Adebayo Akade. It is double celebrations. At this occasion, it's also the is to celebrate the, the, the success story of the Splash FM, one of the most known radio stations in Nigeria. A great impact in the investment of the people of Ibadan and New York State in general. With a public lecture to be delivered a renowned educationist. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are here every year to celebrate the birthday of our father. And today is another day for the celebration. I want to say that Chief Adebayo is a known person in Ibadan, a philanthropist to the core, a man of integrity, a man of business and a man of transparency, honesty. I want to say that I'm happy to be part of this celebration and I believe that Oyo State 
is happy about this because he has contributed in no in a long I mean, he has contributed a lot to the development of Oyo State particularly in man administration he has been a support in everything that we do and I believe that he is today I believe that today he is here to celebrate the 79th birthday and I believe that my absence here is not intentional because I've traveled outside Nigeria. I wish him successful celebration and I believe that everybody who is here will continue to pray for him such that he will continue to do whatever he's doing in the name of Allah. Thank you very much. All right. You, you know, I will ask you to do that again. It's for the governor of the state and the deputy governor of the state, His Excellency, Chief Michael Adeyemo. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, thank you very much for those very wonderful words. Um, quickly, before we move on, it's time for us to listen to our lecture. Um, yes, I, I think we're still on schedule, a little bit on schedule. Uh, I'd like to welcome very quickly, recognize them, so that I will not lose my ID card a journalist. I'd like to welcome the chairman of NUG or your state, Mr. Adewumi. Mr. Fanero, if you're still here, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Please put your hands together for Mr. Fanero, even if he's not here. Um, a number of my colleagues are here. I've seen them. I'd like to quickly thank them for coming. But this one is a senior colleague who, on Tuesday, you listen to him on Splash FM. If you've ever heard the word YS Live on Splash FM, he's here. I always love his variety of bow ties. Yes. Mr. Yemi Shunde, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. That's Jigan Akala. I wanted to ask him, but I want to Jamalaluni. Okay. Quickly, the President General Central Council of Ibado Indigent CCII and its executive members. Permit me to welcome Chief Yemi Shola Doye. Welcome, sir. Thank you for coming. Okay, without wasting any time, uh, I'd like to quickly go into the very quickly now. Now, how I do that? He had told me and the editor that he does not want citation. Am I correct? So, we won't do so much of citation, but why are you still sitting down? Before you stand up, sir, I don't have a citation here. But I have something I want to describe you by while you are sitting. I penned down this morning that we have a privilege again to host a cerebral scholar one you can call a scholar of scholars no doubt as a teacher of teachers and academics a quintessential educationist for me i haven't listened to him his remarkable footprints of excellence dotted the landscape of our education sector and you cannot contest that in any way his endeavor is a spread across science education, computer education, if you like, and environmental education. This professor is a specialist in higher education, science, computer, and environmental education. He is the first African to win the United Nations Scientific Cultural Organization Kalinga Prize for communication and popularization of science in 1993. I know that one. A former executive secretary of the National Universities Commission, NUC, with over 130 international published works and more. Welcome, Professor Peter A. Okebukola, OFR, for the 11th anniversary lecture of Splash 
105.5 FM. We want to win a war, the battle against the pressed quality of education. Chairman of the occasion, Chief Adibayo Yoru, our Daddy High Chief Mortal Yuakonde, MFR, the celebrant of today. Our mommy, Chief Oni Kepo, Dr. Chief Oni Kepo Akonde, CON, two time Minister of Federal Republic, and the immediate past president, the number one chief of commerce and industries in Nigeria, indeed in Africa, the Lagos. Chamber of Commerce and Industries. A star-studded audience, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, recognize a handful of other persons uh, for reasons which you will know in a minute. Uh, one is our daddy, uh, Professor Aki Mabogunje, who is the chair of the governing board of the Center for Human Security and Dialogue of Olusha Passenger Presidential Library, where I serve as director. I recall the MC saying that uh, he's looking forward to a day when Professor Mabogunje will win the Nobel Prize. MC, Professor Akima Bogunje has won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in geography. A few months ago, uh, he won that award, which was bestowed on him in, in France. So, Baba Professor Akima Bogunje is doing Nigeria proud, he's doing Africa proud, and we are extremely delighted uh, about his progress. Of course, our daddy also, Professor Lucas, who has uh, contributed his immense quota to health security in the world. Uh, I also want to identify, or rather recognize, uh, Dr. Lekon Are. And uh, here on my short list, I have Professor Ayo Banjo. Professor Ayo Banjo is the owner of this university, by the way. He was vice chancellor of this university. Just like the chairman said, uh, I left this university just a few years ago, only 48 years ago. I took my exam in this trenchard on 48 years ago. And uh, Professor Ayobanjo goes down in history as one of the most successful vice chancellors of the University of Ibada. He is currently the chairman of the governing board of the National Universities Commission, meaning that he holds the key to quality for all the universities uh, in this country. Now, when Group Captain Dr. B.C. Ojebola retired, extended the invitation of uh, Daddy High Chief Akonde to me. I took a pen. I did that about several months ago several months ago. I took a pen and canceled all engagements I had crowded this day with. When Chief Akonde calls, you must listen, you must hack him. So here I am to share my thoughts with you on the important subject of quality of our educational system. I take a minute to uh, look at the matter that our chairman raised about quality and standards. Let me liken it to, let, let me take this group, this column here, to be standards in education, and this to be quality. You will see in a minute that they are interrelated, but they are different. But you know in education, everybody's an expert. But in law, you can't be an expert. You people, all commerce, they may call, they will say they are expert in education. But in technical sense, in education, there are two different things. So what are standards? 
standards are those measures that have been set for a particular education system. For instance, you will say that for SSCE chemistry, these are the standards. These are the topics that you will learn. These are the ratios for teacher-students. These are the ratios for laboratory to equipment. These are, these, are, these are standards set. For quality, okay, let, let me still go back to standards. While I was doing my senior, we call it West African School Certificate in those days. Those days, not too far. In 1966, when I did my SSC, the chemistry that I learned, I'd like all of you to be reflecting on what you learned while you were in school and what these kids are now learning. The standards that were set, by the time I look at the, uh, while I was doing the, junior, uh, the National Young Scientists Competition and the Junior Engineers, Technicians and Scientists Competition, when I look at the standards for chemistry, 20 years ago, they were higher than what I learned while in school. Today, go look at the chemistry that we're asking our SSC people to learn. That's about the same kind of chemistry that I learned in UI in my part one after my higher school. So by way of standards, they are what we have set. Let me move up to university to, to quickly exemplify that. Uh, the, if you look at the minimum academic standards that are set for our universities, look, come 20 years ago, and look at that document, and look at the document for last year, for instance. You find that what we're expecting our undergraduates to learn is much more now than what we learned while in school. You also find that the ratios, teacher-student ratios, uh, ratio regarding equipment uh, to, to, uh, to students, uh, library holdings to student ratio, all these ratios have gone up. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the standards. And they have not fallen. They are rising, and they are rising, and they are rising. What about you here? Quality. I also use the analogy, or let's use the analogy of uh, uh, jumping, uh, this high jump in the Olympics. The Olympics committee may say, okay, before you can qualify to come for the finals, you will jump 1.5 meters. So that's the standard. And you will have noticed over the years, that standard has been going up. Now, if you as an athlete will jump above the 1.5 meters, so you have met the standards, indeed surpassed it. So your quality is high. But if you are not able to jump over that minimum standards, then your quality is low. So they are interrelated, but they are completely different. So when I hear people say, standards to fall, I don't argue with them more because they are entitled to what they say. But in the technical sense in education, and all of you will claim to, all of us will claim to be experts, it is wrong, it is strong, it is strong. So I'm agreeing with uh, the, the, the lecturer in 1981 who, who said that the standards are, uh, not, uh, are not falling. But it's the quality, the quality of the people wanting to jump the standards that you have getting uh, depressed. I congratulate Splash 105.5 FM on its 11th anniversary. Now, this is a radio station like no other for educating, informing, and entertaining the citizenry and a credible medium for fostering national unity. I wish the management and staff many more successes in the decades ahead. Uh, when I visited our daddy, high chief, Bayou Akonde, yesterday, and I saw him, if he put a cap on his head to cover his gray hairs, he looked like a 41-year-old person to me. <laughs> and our mama, Dr. Onikeku Akonde, she looked to me yesterday like a 20-year-old. Today, 
She's looking like a 16-year-old. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the great God of heaven and earth has blessed them tremendously. And I give God the glory. And I pray God for many more healthy and happy years ahead. For the high chief by the family. And for those of you that are here, now just note your age. If it is X, if your age is X, I pray God that it should be, you know, uh, it should be, you should live to be X plus 50. Huh? You don't want that? In good health, X plus 50, no matter what you, our, our, our daddy, Professor Akimabo Gunje, He's just 45 years old. <laughs> so if I add 50 to it, it will be like 90-something. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so God will continue to be with us. And God will continue to shower his grace and blessings on us. And let me tell you my, my personal view about longevity. Looking, you know, you're looking young or, or, or old or whatever. It's essentially the grace of God. I recall that in this hour you are. In this our independence also, almost one-fifth of those that had entered this UI wave in 1970 had gone. Many of those who will say, oh, you have to jog, 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 jog. Oh, don't eat this one. There's cholesterol there. Uh, this one, there's too much of this thing there. Many of them are no more with us. So it's just the grace of God. I'm still young. I'm approaching 68. But I give God all the glory. And every day I wake up, I kneel down and say, Abba, Father, you have done me well. Please give me many more years in good health. And this same God that will continue to answer my prayers will also answer your prayers. In this lecture, I will begin by reminding us of the critical role of quality education national development and then proceed to provide a situation analysis of the education sector. Here I will show the mess we are in in terms of quality. Thereafter I will highlight what we must do to win the battle against poor quality and restore the shine to the education sector. I have maybe 35 or more minutes now. So you're going to get a copy of the lecture and you'll find a, a lot more details that I'm going to be rendering to you. And besides, what is it that I'm going to tell you that you, you do not know? Except, of course, there are some statistics that you may not be aware of, uh, statistics as latest as today that I'll be sharing with you. So I'll gallop very quickly through uh, a number of the issues and they expect that you will be able to get the fuller gist in the paper. Education as cornerstone for development. For the purpose of the lecture, I've defined education in a very broad sense. I've defined it as a process of updating the knowledge and skills of the individual for the purpose of making that individual useful to himself or herself, and to the community. It is not strictly taken to mean going to school. Although, going to school is a pathway to receiving education. The home, the church, the mosque, and other places of worship, the marketplace, a ride in a public bus, interaction with significant others, your friends, your colleagues, and siblings, an apprenticeship in an automatic workshop and some other pathways. This different in quotes now roads to education form the basis for the classification, say formal, non-formal, and informal. The formal road being school-based, the non-formal in non-school settings, such as learning to be a barber or tailor as an apprentice of the master barber or tailor. That's not formal. Non-formal education is also offered through the mass media in the form of 
educational broadcasting and the programs of Slash 105.5 FM. The informal pathway is through casual and usually unplanned interaction with other persons or things. Watching the mother cook in the kitchen is an informal way of daughters, also sons who dare to come, learning important culinary skills. In past centuries, the geographical area now known as Nigeria was home to technically advanced societies, renowned for their artistic, commercial, and political achievements. Today, Nigeria remains one of Africa's most influential countries. Its vast oil reserves and unique human resources create the capacity for enormous prosperity and regional leadership. In spite of this promising profile, and as, and as a consequence of decades of corruption and poor macroeconomic management, at least one in two people, as the 2018 data for the Brookings Institution show, only about three weeks ago uh, was that report uh, made public, live in absolute poverty, deprived of access to the basics of food, water, and shelter. Let me now take you on a ride where we look at the situation analysis of the education sector. Now go back a little bit. A historical tour of the development of education in Nigeria is a good point to begin discussions on where we are today in the education sector. Formal, that is Western type education, was part of the Christian missionary efforts of the mid 19th, 19th century. The first primary school opened its doors in 1842, and 17 years later, the first secondary school. Both schools were sited in Lagos, being the port of entry of the missionaries. The packaging of education with the Christian faith was the reason, major reason, for the hesitation of the largely Muslim North to accept Western education. In 1880, when the colonial government took, took count of the missionary schools in the country, preparatory to enacting the 1881 education ordinance, there were 56 of such schools in the south and only 18 in the north. The British colonial government intervened by approving the establishment of government schools, for now mainly in the north. However, the rate of establishment of mission schools had faced government efforts, and by 1920, the schools in the South, where Western-type education was offered, had numbered those in the North about 10 times. This turned out to be one of the early causes, one of the early causes of the educational imbalance between the North and the South of Nigeria. The requirement for high-level human resources led to the establishment, also in Lagos, of the first higher institution, the Yaba Higher College. The college was established in 1932 and it formed template for the establishment of the University College of Baden in, University College of Baden in 1948. UCI secured autonomy from the University of London in 1962 as a full-fledged university. From independence to date, the education enterprise has gone through tensions and fair weather, high points and low points. Let me give you a few of these high and low points. From less than 3,000 primary schools in 1960, enrolling about 1.3 million pupils, there are now over 94,000 public and private schools with enrollment in excess of 32 million. Secondary school numbers and enrollment went from 1,227 and 24,640 respectively in 1960 to over 25,000 public and private secondary schools in 2018 with about 20.4 million students. Now, at the tertiary level, there has been similar growth. From one university college in 1960, there are now one 
65 universities. The 165th one was added only last week with aggregate student population of over 2 million full-time and part-time. Now, since population growth rate outpaced the education sectoral growth rate, such quantitative expansions failed to significantly reduce literacy rates. The education report card saw a leap in many of the quantitative indicators between 1960 and 2018. Now, continuing with gross morphological comparisons of the sector 1960 and 2018, now with a lens of quality, finish with quantity, stark differences pop up. The graph takes a downward plot. In 1960, chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the standard six product had good skills, good skills for the workplace. In 2018, the typical university graduate, I'm not saying all, the typical university graduate can hardly be touched with a 10 meter pole by serious minded employers. I digress one second. Uh, in, uh, what was it, 20, uh, what is it, 20, 2006, I, I, I took a couple of uh, applications for approval for private university to the Free Reserve Council. Finished my presentation, the president, President Bass, just said, yes, uh, any comments approved? What ministry is this? They don't approve. Uh, Bass just said, why? Say, why are we going to be approving more? The ones that we have, the products are as useless as anything. I took serious objection. And I, you know, started attacking the, the, the person. The person said, we're going to chase me out of the press. I can't be talking to his minister like that. And I said, his minister can also not be, to be talking, not, can't be talking about my conspiracy like that. Then the minister said, Mr. Executive Secretary, let me just give you two examples. And one other minister was sitting by. So myself and this, uh, this, this minister and I, we uh, organized some interview for graduates from your years, from your universities. Somebody who claims to have 2 1, two one in computer science does not know what a mouse is. Very good. I'm, I'm glad that, 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 that's what I told him. Said, Somebody, is that, he asked the other person, is that not true? The person said, yes, that's what happened. That somebody who has a BSc chemistry, 2-2, two, two, they asked him about acid-based titration, what I learned one million years ago in the secondary school. And that person didn't know it. I was alarmed. By the way, my application for approval was turned down that day. So I I rushed back. I was furious. I went back to the commission, and I convened a meeting of management. And I said, people, what is happening here? This is what I heard. Can that be true? Oh, they said, Mr. Secretary, me, you don't know. Ah, I nearly entered the ground. I thought that my people <laughs> will. They said, me, you don't know. I said, don't know what? That look, several of these universities, what they are doing is this. Because they are, um, they are proprietors, as well as state universities, they are very, very poorly funded. They are the worst among the three clusters that we have. Federal, state, and private. The state universities are the worst in terms of funding. The funding gap is as huge as this. Fortunately, I had opportunity uh, that the vice president gave to me. They had the uh, National Council on Education, excuse me, National uh, Economic Council meeting two Thursdays ago. Yeah, two Thursdays ago, I was asked to address all the governors. And I told them, the funding gap there is huge. So when the governor will tell the vice chancellor, oh, look, oh, we are only going to give you 40% to pay your salaries. So go and look for the rest. So that's what is happening. Go and look for the rest. Where am I going to get the rest? So what they do, what the vice chancellor then do is they will open and you know it. They open all manner of sandwich programs all over the place. And in a typical sandwich program center, you now have uh, some people who have enrolled. Let's take this computer science person. We're enrolled to do computer science and uh, we'll 
not come to class. Towards the close of the semester, we'll now go to a lecturer. Lecturer, I've just come from Dubai. I can see that the size of a shirt is 16 and a half. Uh, we'll pack uh, about uh, four or five shirts to give to a lecturer. Okay. And then, oh, sir, I noticed that the tire of your motor dome do something. We'll bring two tires. Or that uh, at, at Christmas or the festive seasons, uh, we'll now go to, ah, mommy, well, well done, no. Uh, just give this small envelope for, for this thing, bag of rice at 7%. What's adult literacy rate? You see, if you, if you took those who are said to be adults in a population of 198 million, and then uh, literacy rate by definition of UNESCO, not only is how to read and write, not only in English, oh, if you read Yoruba, you are literate. If you can write, literate. So literacy rate in, is defined as the pro 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 proportion of the adult population that is able to write, read and write in any language. So we have very, you know, the uh, uh, statistic is poor here. It's part of the huge resources. Nigeria is rubbing shoulders with countries on the ignoble list of poor performance in education. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Nigeria is too endowed to have about 12% of its basic education kids sitting on the floor or under trees to learn in 2018. Less than 20% of the public primary schools in the country are sufficiently resourced to deliver quality basic education. Yet, officials of local and state governments to which this level of education is assigned are feeding fat through jumbo salaries, big cars, huge personal mansions, and are known for ostentatious living. When I came back from, uh, uh, my way back from the UK some few weeks ago, I ran into a top uh, uh, UK uh, official. And he said to me, where are you going? I'm going back to uh, Nigeria. I'm going to Lagos. I'm going back to Nigeria. I said, I said, what is wrong with your country? And I said, wrong how? I have a great country. There's nothing wrong with my country. Uh, and he said, oh, did you know that in this London alone, London, that about, let me see, um, uh, about, uh, uh, let's see, he said about a hundred, whether I was, whether I was exaggerating or not, I wouldn't know, but it's a top British government official, that uh, we have property owned by Nigerians coming to close to, uh, close to 120, no, no, one. Is it 10 or 120 billion pounds sterling owned by Nigerians? And about seven months ago, I was coming from the eastern part of the world. I came on Emirates. I got to uh, Dubai to connect the flight to here, to Lagos. And somebody asked me, somebody, just one, one Dubai official said, Sir, do you, did you know that almost, when I was exaggerating, I wouldn't know, almost half of the houses that they have in Dubai are owned by Nigerians. Now, what is wrong with you people? For me, if just a small fraction of that money were invested in education, all this my long grandma here will not be, will not be told. But all these are our people. They loot our money, they take it over there, but the day of judgment is coming, oh? Yes, the day of judgment is coming. Between 1960 and 1975, the system attracted respectable funding and the quality of delivery was comparable to what obtained in institutions all over the world. The system benefited from a high dose of high qualified local and expatriate staff. The contributions of Nigerian scholars to the research literature patents and inventions we are about the most outstanding in Africa. Indeed, between 1965 and 1970, Nigeria contributed the highest in Africa to the international literature in science, engineering, medicine, social sciences, and arts. Teaching quality was equally exemplary. So also were community and extension services. However, by the late 1970s, 
some crack has started to develop in a system. Something interesting. When, if somebody graduated from, this is our UI, 1980, he will say that, oh, you see, the quality of, uh, uh, of uh, graduates started to fall after the person finished. If you ask somebody who graduated from 1990, it will tell you the quality started to fall from that 1990. Those who are in 2000, that graduated just like yesterday, they will tell you, oh, uh, the, look, the quality started to fall in 2000. But I want to tell you empirically when this they started to fall. But the, 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 the logic of my argument is that it has been falling and falling and falling and falling and falling since. So any point that you see, you are even better than the next point. So how did this whole thing start to... Uh, this, uh, the, the oil boom of the early 1970s <laughs> has started to clear. And the huge injection of funds into the system started to win. This triggered a slight depression in the quality of delivery, though not dramatic enough to upstage the eminence of Nigeria in the African higher education space. As stated earlier, by the mid-1980s, quality started to depress at an alarming rate. Mind what I've said. And this is standard. I said quality started to depress at an alarming rate. Two major factors conspired to trigger what is now regarded as a tipping point for poor quality. The first is a structural adjustment program which brought in its wake the devaluation of the Naira. More or less overnight, the money available to educational institutions, especially universities, depreciated about 200%. Expatriate staff salaries became non-competitive and exodus back to their home countries began in earnest. May I recall, while I was here, my chemistry, my chemistry class, uh, Professor Biddlestone, uh, Professor Hurst, all these wonderful scientists from out there, what they were earning was slightly better than what they would have earned in their home countries. But when this adjustment came in, the salary just dropped significantly. And so what would they want to do with less than what it So they then had to, uh, uh, to, to, go, to go back. Laboratory equipment and library books typically purchased with foreign exchange became increasingly out of reach on account of the devalued Naira. Gradually, old equipment could not be replaced. Latest books and journals could not be purchased. The decay are set in in earnest, and quality began to lose that. Our chairman will recall that when we were in Independence Hall, it was like a two, maybe three, a two-star hotel. Those before us maybe enjoyed more than we did, but I, I think we were at the point when the thing, uh, you had left, sir, but by the time I left in 1973, uh, it had started to bite. So, you go to, in the, in the, uh, in the hall, we're, we're two in the room. Uh, every morning, we get people to dress our rooms. You change our best bed sheets. If you have dirty clothes, you put them out there, and uh, the laundry people will come pick them and return them. Uh, our cool room, our library, everything was working quite fine. Those people who were there, just, uh, you enjoyed those days? I'm sure you did. Uh, the second reason for the sharp decline in quality in the mid-1980s and the beginning of the decay in the system was the acceptance by political leaders of the advice by the Bretton Woods institutions, that's the World Bank and IMF, that African leaders should invest more on basic education and less on higher education. Sharp reduction in allocation to universities became common practice. Now, occurring at the same time as the devalued Naira, universities found themselves in dire financial straits. Quality took a hard beating. 
as it turned out, the phenomenon described above was a feature of the higher education landscape in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. The region suffered severe setback in the higher education subsector. The scars, ladies and gentlemen, are still visible today in most pre-1970 universities in Africa. Moving further on the road from 1960 to date, we encounter significant landmark events, many of which were among the so-called dividends of democracy. We have establishment of all the state and private universities and the Federal Universities of Technology coincided largely with periods of democratic governance. Funding of the universities also observed a boost. The military is ascribed credit for the establishment of most of the second generation federal universities and perhaps the two else beside. The disdain of the academia has been suggested as raison d'etre for the lackluster support of the military for university development. Now let me fast track to 2000. The universities were short of everything, short of everything but students. There was acute shortage of staff to cope with a much expanded system. Funding inadequacies persisted. Quality of instructional delivery was poor. Frequent strikes leading to closures exerting toll on quality of graduates. Incidents of uh, examination malpractice, cultism, and sorting did not abate. Many graduates, especially from illegal satellite camp, uh, campuses, unapproved universities, degree mills, and sandwich programs demonstrated incompetence and because of their large numbers, gave the Nigerian graduate a poor public image of being half baked. From 2000 to date, the system eased slowly, very slowly, into a recovery mode. Success stories are chalked up in a number of fronts. Within the last eight years, funding, especially uh, to federal universities, has taken a huge leap. In 2013, an unprecedented 200 billion was approved, not necessarily released, for the system. The Education Trust Fund, now Tertiary Education Trust Fund, TED Fund, injected more money into the public university system than they had done in the past. The Science and Technology Education, post basic, that is the B, funding went some way to improve facilities and build human and institutional capacities. More admission spaces were provided with more universities licensed to operate thus easing, albeit in a little way, the problem of access. The National Open University of Nigeria added an open and distance learning perspective to enhance access. Further, staff salaries took an upward swing as a spin-off of the 2009 strike action by university staff unions. Within the last three years, ladies and gentlemen, there have been impressive efforts to improve the education delivery system. For instance, NUC, under the chairmanship, government board chairmanship of Professor Ayobanjo, has been very vigorous in its quality assurance operations. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, in spite of this, these silver linings, the dark clouds of poor quality input, poor quality process, and output still rage. The pace of the recovery process needs to quicken. In sum, summarize, what are the 2018 key issues and challenges? Enrollment rates at all levels of education are low. It's what is called the higher education participation rate, HEPR. It's a UNESCO indicator among several other indicators. What is HEPR? HEPR is the proportion of the population 
that is of higher education age range that is in higher education. Let me give you a description. Let's assume that this is the population of all of us here. We make up the 198 or so people, uh, million people in Nigeria. And those between, that's how you describe as, uh, as uh, defined it, between ages 16 and 35, we are here, ages 16 and 35, this one. That's the higher education, the group that can go into higher education. If you are 100 here, 100, and 50 of you are able to get into higher education, then the HEPR is 50%. The higher education participation rate, that's the proportion of you that's not able to get higher education. And higher education is not only university, so you have polytechnics, you have college of education, and the others. The higher education participation rate in Many countries that are moving quite well ranges between 50 and 60 percent. South Africa, about eight years ago, decided that they're going to expand access to quality higher education and the HEPR will be 20 percent. Four years ago, they attained 20 percent and I think today they'd be like 22%. Today, the HEPR for Nigeria is less than 10%. So you can see the gap that uh, we need to fill. So that's one of the issues. Not only uh, numbers in school low, but the quality of learning outcomes is poor. The curriculum is not appropriate for the needs of modern society, which seeks to create a competitive an efficient economy. Secondary and tertiary education are failing to prepare our students for the world of work and failing to contribute to national regeneration. The technical and vocational education programs that are oriented towards teaching traditional skills are not linked to market needs and do not place the graduates at a competitive advantage with their university counterparts. Inadequate attention is paid to the learning needs of adults and youth in a non-formal setting. The education sector both suffers from and helps to create social cultural problems that we have in Nigeria today. I want to move rather fast here to look at uh, what you find in the, in, in the, in the paper. Uh, 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 why are we where we are? And I've looked at the challenge of policy and policy implementation. You all know, as well as I do, we have done the analysis. I can give you the empirical figures. If you look at our national policy on education, bring the national policy, the US, the UK, bring national policy anywhere. For, in, if, go to mass if they have national policy there. Line up our own and do a content analysis, you find that the Nigerian national policy on education will match all of these other ones. So, what is the problem? The problem is that we indicate we're going to do this, and we don't do it. You have a huge gap between policy prescriptions and policy implementation. What's still when you have a new government in place, this is usually at the state level, uh, the new governor will say, oh, you see, education is in shambles. That's what the first thing they say. Education is in shambles. Road is shambles. Everything is shambles. So we are the Messiah. We are going to fix the thing. And all the wonderful policies that are in place, they will push these aside and try to put their own in place and they end up, what, the gap between that policy and practice will be wider than the previous one. And they will leave the state worse than the method. And indeed, while I was in office as a general secretary, that was 17 years ago, 
when a vice chancellor is appointed, the procedure is that council of the university will select or rather interview candidates and they will give three names. The three names we forwarded to the president through the minister. The minister will send the three names to me. I will do a security check. I will send this to the director general SSS. Please tell me these three. Do your security checks. And then when the security reports come, we'll then take the, the, the three names and the security reports. The minister and I will go to President Obasanjo. President, these are the names. And President Obasanjo was very clear. Don't bother me with this. Whoever has come first and has no negative security report, the person is appointed. So it's quite easy. Drag out his pen. He will say, Professor so and so appointed as vice chancellor, investor of so and so, with effect from that, that, that. So when the letter is now written, I would enter, vice chancellor, please come. Come with all your principal officers. So when they come to NUC, I sit with, he, with them, with my management. I say, VC, Please and please, don't go back to your university and say, oh, the former vice chancellor has spoiled everything. The university is a mess, a oh, complete mess. We am now here. I'm the Messiah to, to rectify everything. And I will tell him, let that go down the chain of command. Let your deans know. When a new dean is elected into office, me, in Abuja, we don't want to hear through and usually credible sources from the university that the dean is now saying, oh, you know, the previous dean didn't do anything. No. That dean messed up the whole thing. I'm now the Messiah. I'm now going to straighten everything. Tell Mr. Vice Chancellor and you, Bossa, all of these people, go and tell your HODs that when a new HOD is appointed by the VC, New HOD, don't go there to say, you know, that for my HOD, didn't do well. Ah, but you've been that department, oh. Why did you join to make the place good? Mr. Dean, you have been in that faculty. Why don't you join to make the place good? And I always give them this analogy that, you see, God is wonderful. He has not created us to be the same. Any institution like Universal Ibado or the country like Nigeria. Any leader, God has given us, uh, it, like, like those two uh, uh, establishments, the university, all the, all, the, all the state of Nigeria, they are like buildings. There are some people who are good electricians. That's the strength that they have. So when they come to the building, they do the electrical very nicely. And of course, since they are not good plumbers, oh, by the way, that word, you know, I had a, an interesting chat with uh, some people two days ago. I said, I said, my friend, the pronunciation, I know you but the Professor Banjo people, they have told us that when it, that B, that next B, so long as something is after it, it's silent. So you don't say plumber, you say plumber. I'm sorry to insult you. Can we say plumber? I beg you, when you live here, this is not a lecture. We are going to do an exam. When you live here, don't go out there and say, plumber. It's plumber. God bless you. Now, the other one, that's also an aside. You know, uh, bomb, B O M B. By the time another word now comes after it, like B O M B, then E R. That other B, the second B is also now silent. It's a suicide. Bomber, no suicide bomber. Ah, uh, but back on day will punish you if you if you begin to. Uh. So I've always likened this thing to be uh, uh, a, a house in progress, and everybody God has endowed them differently. So the vice chancellor, who God has endowed to be a plumber, you find that he will do some things right. Back to the analogy of the building. He will do the plumbing work of that building well. But he can't do the electrical because that's not his strength. So the next vice chancellor may be endowed with the electrical. He will fix the electrical. The next one may be good in painting. I'm using the analogy, not that it's going to be painting university. Will paint the place well. 
So I've always told people that it's a, it's a, it's a mark of uh, if complex. A complex is that you don't have, I mean, yeah, it's complex. When you get to some place and you say, ah, no, they have not done anything well. My friend, draw a line and do your own. You agree with that? So all our, I'm giving a message to all our political leaders, all vice chancellors, all, uh, by the way, the visits are meeting today uh, for a retreat. I was supposed to be there. But when Chief Akode calls, nobody, even if Donald Trump calls me today, now here the day. So I'll be rushing to join them there. So vice chancellors, deans, head of the department, we always tell them, just do your bit. Pray to God to give you the wisdom and strength to get this thing uh, done. So I've talked about policy. We have a lot said in the, in the book that you get about policy. Now let's look at the curriculum. Now the curriculum uh, at, all, at all levels are too loaded. They are overloaded in quotes. Overloaded. So we need to uh, have a rethink, a reformatting of our curriculum. We need to share the fact. Good enough, you are, you are having the copies of this here. We need to share the fact in the curriculum. Let's say the teacher factor. That is one major thing. Many of our teachers are grossly incompetent, especially in content knowledge. You see, a teacher, when he or she has been trained, is given three knowledge seats on three knowledge bases. One is the content knowledge. Let's take the geography teacher. I'm taking the example of geography because of our daddy, Professor Akima Bobo. Geography teacher. This is the, you are to teach secondary school, the secondary school curriculum, and you have maybe like 80 topics there. As a teacher of geography, you should be well soaked in all those topics. And there should be a gradient. A gradient is like this. The gradient between you and the students you are teaching in that subject. So the teacher preparation, where you have been prepared to teach in the secondary school, the program should teach you to have very high content knowledge. The second one is pedagogic knowledge. What's pedagogic knowledge? Pedagogic knowledge is knowledge of how to teach, how to use the chalkboard, how to ask questions, class management, and all of that. The third one is the combination of the two, pedagogic content knowledge. That is, how to teach that your subject, how to teach your geography. Let me tell you what's happening out there. What's happening out there is, that, or rather, the expectation is for the teacher, uh, you should have like about 70 to 80% of what you are being prepared, what have been taught in the teacher preparation institutions, in the teacher preparation institution to be content knowledge. So you have rich, you know the content. And then the remaining 20 to 30 percent will be the others. But what is happening here now is that at the very best in all our teacher preparation institutions, the content knowledge is about 40, maximum 50 percent. So what, do you, what happens? I'd like you when you live here, if you have time, go to any of our schools. Sit, if you are a chemistry teacher, sit there, or math teacher, and watch what these teachers are teaching. They don't know as much if, as the children they are teaching. That's the truth. That's the truth because that's what I do. That's my business. So we have that challenge with teachers. Apart from the training, you all know as well as I do, that today, ninth day of June 2018, in not less than 10 states, teachers are owed not less than eight months' salary. So, on what, how, how do you deliver education? How do you win a battle against quality when the teacher, who is supposed to be the captain of the troops, the man is hungry or woman is hungry? The man is not well trained in the, in the, uh, in the military. Uh, is, is not well trained to go and fight a battle. How does that person win that battle? I will uh, 
Like I said, you get all of this in there. I'm just going to move quickly to, yeah, student-related challenges. Hey, the students these days, oh, they are not ready to learn nothing. They are only ready to cheat, assisted by their parents, shame and shame on all those parents. The parents these days, they pay the teachers to help their kids in the exam. They will not, when the child comes to, to home, they will, they will allow the child Facebook and all the social media, that's what they engage in. Go and watch the typical child in the home. You find that boy or girl, they are watching channels, Mnet, all these dance, dance, dance things. That's what they do. And you parents just sit there, even enjoy the thing with them. While I was, you see, the, the federal government had, it's like governing board for their unity schools. I was the chairman for King's College. And I insisted, I told all the parents, look, you people, all your children, there's a channel on DSTV. It's called 319. It's Learn. All the subjects, English, math, ge uh, ge geography, whatever, that channel helps, the, the, helps children to learn. When you go home, those people with DSTV, please tune to 319 and see what will happen. I insisted that all the children, when they get back, they must at least two hours a the day watch 319. So our students are not ready to learn. I recently conducted a survey of reading culture, reading culture in the Nigerian University system. Our daddy, Professor Ibanjo, has a copy of that report. And it's clear that our students are not reading as well as they, as, as they used to do. So the challenge of facilities. If you went to any of the public primary schools, Typical public primary school. You will lament. Roofs leaking. Floor. No tables, no nothing. And our political leaders are out there enjoying all over the place. I think the conscience, conscience, Mr. Conscience, I'm going to call Mr. Conscience to go and visit them. So, you have that challenge of facilities. So, we're going to a battle. Ladies and gentlemen, that is quality in our front. And quality has well-trained troops in teachers, facilities, students, curriculum, and all that. And we are here, you know, we are here trying to win that battle. So I'm going to go, uh, also we have the challenge of curriculum delivery. Uh, these are the people we are going to uh, fight against. So let's, let me go very quickly as a roundup to how we can win the battle of depressed quality. I'll talk about the curriculum. We need to share the fat in our curriculum at all levels and ensure we embed what you call 21st century skills. Make them relevant. Make them, tie them to, uh, to development issues in Nigeria, make them entrepreneurial, and uh, I've said quite a lot in there how we can uh, win the battle with the curriculum reformatting. How we can win the battle against low teacher quality. There are three things we must do. One is we will have to, we, we should adopt uh, the Finland model. By the way, the F Finland has, in the ranking, has the best educational system. And uh, some two years, no, a year ago, I led the federal government delegation to go and understudy the Finland system. The teacher in Finland is as well paid as the doctor and the engineer. The teacher in Finland is not owed a couple a salary. To get into the any teacher training institution in Finland, you have to be the best in your class. The competition is very thick. Here in Nigeria, when 
your child cannot go to read medicine, to read law, to read any of these things. They come to vice and vice says, help me, help me, help me, help me this person. Oh, you can see he has scored very, very low. These other programs are full. He or she has not met the minimum. Ah. So, Paul is very joke. I will sit at home for one year. Just let me put him somewhere. Okay. Uh, I don't see faculty of education here. You know. We go to faculty of education. Just put him, put him, put him somewhere. So that person is the faculty of education, poorly motivated. The child is unhappy. And we, in Finland, as I said, you don't have a situation where, uh, if, you, if you looked at the jam printout, listing the number of applicants for, number of applicants for different uh, disciplines, at the bottom of the list of about 20 is education and agriculture. So we need to take some steps to win that battle of getting better quality teachers through improving the welfare scheme of teachers, improving their training. I have made some suggestions about how we can improve training. We have to remodel the teacher preparation program. They have to take many more of the subject area courses. The teaching practice, let me tell you a typ typical teaching practice. You find in the Faculty of Education of any university, say you are going to go on 12 weeks teaching practice. They just throw these kids all over the place, these children, uh, these students all over the place. Teacher no go go there for inspection. Until two days to when the teacher is to submit this course. So the lecturer or professor, whatever, will not just go, 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 you go to a school, uh -huh. which, uh, which, uh, uh, have you been, have you been observed? Say, no, no, no. Okay, fine. So, uh, can you get a class? Oh, all the classes are busy. My friend, get a class quickly. I just, yeah, okay. After five minutes, you will write, I'll go to another place, I'll go to another place, I'll go to another place. In those good old days, Mr. Lecturer will come before your class, Gentleman or lady, where is your lesson note for this lesson? We'll read it with you, correct you, and then you go to the class. He or she will say, the supervisor will sit at the back. When you are, we we'll sit throughout. When you are finished, we will now call you. I will then together do an x-ray analysis of how we have taught. The next time, you are not going to do that. So we have to return to this kind of training regime. We need more time for teaching practice and better, uh, better implementation of uh, the skill. Sandwich, if I had my way again, all the sandwich everywhere, I'm going to close them down. <laughs> all of them. They are selling certificates, so all those sandwich. Somebody tells you, I'm going to do sandwich. I'm going to do that. The sandwich, now poison for the sandwich for bread. They are learning nothing, absolutely nothing. So that will be something we need to took, uh, take a look at. And the other we have to do mentoring. And the last one that I have here, we'll have to do be teacher licensing and, re and uh, re revalidation of license. We want to improve quality. We want to win the battle with good quality teachers. And then somebody earns B. Ed. Economics in 1992, and that person is there in a class, teaching and teaching the old things. In those countries where they have won the battle, or they are really winning the battle against quality, teachers are licensed periodically. So every five years, ah, we want to, we, your license is revalidated. Before it's revalidated, you have to build your, you, you have to, uh, you, you have to improve yourself. You, 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 the revalidation will mean you're being assessed to find out how current you are, what are the, your students saying about you, and all of that, and then you are relicensed. But if you have it like open-ended, the way it is, then we are still going to have that battle lost 
lost and lost on the teacher front. So we must install a mechanism for teacher licensing and revalidation. Now I'm going to close by letting you know one important thing that has happened. And that is uh, several important things are happening, uh, but there's one I want to emphasize, and that is the uh, a new blueprint is about to be launched under the of uh, our daddy, Professor Ayobanjo, as chairman of the governing board of NUC. Blueprint Diversity Education in Nigeria. And uh, we have labeled, just like the Marshall Plan, you know, after the Second World War, Europe was decimated. And the President Truman of the U.S. said, okay, fine, how do we help Europe? And Marshall, who was uh, the Secretary of State, then said, now let's, uh, uh, he came up with a plan, how they can revitalize, uh, how they can rebuild Europe economically. And that's uh, the Marshall Plan. So we have an equivalent of the Marshall Plan, which uh, we have called the Rashid uh, Revitalization Plan. Rashid, by the way, is a new, not so new, it's about one year now, the Executive Secretary of the National Investors Commission, Professor Reed. And uh, that plan uh, identified the following key challenges facing the system. Inadequacies in facilities, as I mentioned, teacher quality uh, issues, and all of that. So on the basis of this, the Rashid plan reads as follows. By 2023, should have increased by a factor of 20% over the 2018 figures. By the way, uh, this, uh, I rendered this at uh, the 23rd Convocation Lecture at the State University, which uh, Professor Sam Ayolaja, former Vice Chancellor of Crover University, uh, presented. Professor Ayolaja, I recognize you, sir. Yeah. Number two, by 2018, the curriculum of Nigerian universities should be rated among the best three in Africa in terms of its relevance to producing national, nationally and regionally relevant graduates who are high human resources for delivering on Africa's vision 2063 and addressing global SDGs. So you tell me, yes, it's talk, but I tell you, this is been action. In another few months, we're going to get a brand new uh, uh, curriculum, the new standards for the university system. Number three, by 2023, at least 30% of facilities for teaching, learning, and research should have been upgraded to meet international standards and maintain. These are the silver linings how we're going to win the battle. We're discussing with Ted Fund, and Ted Fund has bought into this plan for uh, upgrading the facilities. Number four, by 2023, the gap in the number of teachers needed in the Nigerian University system and those in post should have been reduced from 30% to 20%. Number five, by 2023, the quality of graduates from Nigerian universities should be improved by at least 20% of employers and users of products of the system. There are 10 of them who we'll close down by, uh, by way of the following concluding remarks. With a celebration of High Chief Adibayo Akonde and Splash 105.5 FM. Ababa High Chief Akonde has done well in 79 years. We examined the state of education in Nigeria and identified the hurdles by way of quality of this delivery system. The strategies for winning the battle against poor quality were highlighted. My word I said, highlighted. Not necessarily going into all the details we need to, 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 to go into. As I close, let me once again join millions of Nigerians in wishing High Chief Adibaya Akonde many more decades of service to his family, to your state, to Nigeria. 
and to Africa. I, I noticed that uh, Chief Akonde has uh, MFR, member of the Order of the Federal Republic. Chief Akonde deserves to have to be the commander of the Order of the Federal Republic. I will carry the message. If uh, do, do I have your collective voice that we should carry this message to Abuja? Yeah. You have to tell them that Baba Konde deserves to have CFR. Yeah. Approved. Yeah. Now, let, let, let me tell you about these uh, national honors. There are two tracks. There's a track which leads to the president of Nigeria. There's another track which leads to the Vice President. The track of the President is the order of the Federal Republic. Order of the Federal Republic. The one on the Vice President is the order of the Niger. So, the race goes like this. At the start of it, you are just a member of that order. So, you get member of the order of the Federal Republic that's MFR. That's what our daddy Chivakode has. A member on this side is member of the order of the Niger, M-O-N. So when you hear MFR, the person they hear, president's line. When you hear M-O-N, the person is here, vice president's line. After being a member, then you want to be an officer. So the next level is officer of the order of the Federal Republic, OFR. The officer on this line is officer of the order of the Niger, OON. After I don't become officer, you want to be commander now? Uh -huh. So the next one is commander of the order of the Federal Republic here. And on this side is the commander of the order of the Niger, which our mommy has. Dr. Onike Kwakode has COA. And they say, what God has joined together, let the man put us on that. How can you give Baba MFR and give Mama COA? <laughs> That's not good enough, don't you think? So, after CFR, the next one for this one is the Grand Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic. That's GCFR. This one here, the last one, that's the Vice President, Grand Commander of the Order of the Niger. This building there is uh, named after uh, the first uh, vice, the Vice Chancellor who graduated from here, Chief uh, Professor Tekina Tamunu. So, Professor Tekina Tamunu, 17 years ago, was on my board at NUC, and he called me one day and said, Peter, mm. I said, sir, he said, you know, uh, uh, I was OON before, but they, are now, they have now given me CON. I said, congratulations, sir. He said, it means now that I'm a con man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, we wish him uh, very well, and uh, we trust that the federal government will do. You have contributed so much, Baba. You have done so, so well to Nigeria and to Africa. I also want to congratulate Splash 105.5. Please continue the good work that thou doest. Be a platform. That's Splash uh, 105.5 FM. Be a platform of spreading messages of love rather than of hate. Since this lecture is on education, and given my modest science background, I want to request, uh, I'm told that the Iron Lady is there, the COO. Uh, where's the Iron Lady? Uh, she's there somewhere. You see? Oh, 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 splash. I want to request that I be given a 15-minute weekly slot. 15-minute weekly slot on Splash 105.5 FM to share with the listening public the latest development in the world of science. Now, we are in the fourth revolution and the citizenry of Nigeria, young and or old, male or female, should be aware of the power of science in improving a lot at the individual, community, and national levels. 
This could be one of Chief Adebayo Kondi's several contributions to education and, by extension, national development. I thank you for your attention. You don't think he deserve a standing ovation? I think he did all. Splash of him. Can, we, zero five point five. can we give him a standing ovation, please? Let's do that very well. Very well. Splash of him. 105.5. Thank you very much. Please may you, you may have your seat. Thank you. Please do have your seat. Wow. All right. Thank you. Um, we have quite a number of things that we have to do now. But you'll agree with me that that was, that was very educating. Do you agree with me? If you agree, say hi. Thank you. We don't have any nay. So the highest have it. Thank you very much. Prof, thank you very much for that delivery. We appreciate you. We are going to have questions. But before you begin to raise your hand, please don't raise your hand yet because we're going to lay the rules for the question and answer. We're going to lay the rules. But before we do that, I'd like to welcome I'd like to welcome some people very specially, they came in while the lecture was going on, and uh, it's always good to recognize our royal fathers. So our royal fathers are here, and that's in Yoruba land, you pull off your cap before you do that, yes. Uh, so I want to welcome very specially, I'm Baba Wati, Mwawala Aniwane Sey, Oniki Nki Oba Aladeniyo, Kinsi Fi, Nyefungo Bwa, Baba Wati, Olam Fungo Lanfa, Ni Ati Leme Gigun, I like to welcome His Royal Majesty Oba Edi Ojewole, the Ashipa Ulubado of Ibano Land. Please put your hands together. Happy to see you, Baba. Kepwao. Kadi Upelu Riki Bata Upelese. Eshin Obao Joko Pao. Eh, Shashe. I'd like to also welcome very specially another royal father in our midst, His Royal Majesty Oba Kola Adegbola, the Ekaru Balogu of Ibadan land. Kabesi Baba. Kabesi. Eshew. I've also been asked to welcome very specially too a septuagenarian in our midst. I welcome Chief ML Lagmuju. Baba, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for coming. Let me put on notice that we will have presentation of gifts, of plaques for our guest lecturer. We'll also have for our chairman. And someone just whispered to my ears that the sociology department has a special gift for Baba. The HOD is here. I will be calling him when the time comes to do the presentation. And also, our heart Tunde Odunlade is here, who wants to present our original artwork that he had made for our guest lecturer and also for our chairman. For all these people, please put your hands together for them. Please put your hands together for them. Let's appreciate them. So I'll call them when the time comes for us to, to take the presentation. That done, it's time for question and answer. And when I said, I said question, please don't put your hands First, please, let me just lay this. Together we agree. It's question and answer. It's not a time for commendation, or it's not a time for appreciation, or not a time for uh, other things, but the question and answer. So let's agree now. Do we all agree that we'll give only 60 seconds for each person that wants to ask a question? Do we agree? I didn't hear you. Do we agree, everyone? Thank you very much. So let's agree. Yes. Let's agree that 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, I will cut you from talking on Splash FM, premium time. 12,000 naira is one minute. 
So after every 60 seconds, if you don't drop the microphone, I may have to charge you. Thank you very much for that. I've been asked to welcome him. It's important for me to welcome him before I take the question, please. I'd like to welcome him because I know if I don't, I may suffer it. But I welcome the Honorable Commissioner for Information, Culture, and Tourism, Honorable Toye Arulogun. Welcome, sir. So, it's time for question and answer now. I'm going to start from the high table here. I'm going to give it to the high table here. We'll take three here. Very quickly, if you have anyone who has questions here, just three questions. Then we'll take questions from these two rows, this row, and this side. Three each. So let's go. Anyone from this side, sir? All right, sir. There's one there. Daddy. Anyone again? That's it. So let's take it from him. Then we're going to take... We're going to take from here. They'll come in now. When they come here, they'll make the choice here. Three, three, and three. Okay. All right, let's go. One, one, one. All right. Yes, sir. The chairman, the chairman of the occasion. The chairman of the occasion. Our governor here present. The celebrant. All other protocols duly observed. I congratulate Professor Okebukola for a paper well presented. I just want you, sir, to give us, to reconcile some of the presentations you made. You talked about the bad situation of corruption in this system. You talked about calling vice chancellors that, okay, when you take over, just draw a line and move on with your program. And also, you talked about situation report when you assume a position. If a former vice chancellor presents a paper that, okay, Trenchard Hall, I'm leaving Trenchard Hall for you, it's a 10 story building. This same Trenchard Hall in which we are seated. How do you reconcile the aspect of drawing a line and then the corruption level in the system? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. sir should we take all the questions together? All right. The guest lecturer said they only want three questions. So we take one from here, one, and one from here. The man in the heart. Hat, not cap. All, all protocols duly observed. I am Pastor High Chief Yemisi Phillips. When I heard about this uh, topic on Splash FM, because that's the only acceptable radio station in my house and home. I was stupendously or staggeringly disturbed by the topic. I just wondered, what is there to win when there is no battleground, when there are no fighters, when the government is not ready, the parents uh, lackadaisical, the teachers are not well paid, so they are not interested. And the pupils, they have lost a sense of sir, responsibility. Question, sir. So the question is, in this uh, disorganized situation of education, is it possible for us to avoid this depression? Or do we go back to the founding fathers of our educational system, which are the British people? I know the North is running away because of religion. They are saying Western education belongs to Christianity. But education 
a sine qua non to progress, to development, right. to success, right, and even sir. to victory. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, the man, the heart, and then we take female at this side. Uh, the celebrant and the distinguished lecturer, mm, no, uh, all protocol observed. My name is Larry Babadola, ex director of commercial services business. Uh, my question is can there be any consistency in education so that there is no fall? Because, like the lecturer has said, If party A wins an election against party B, it will change its own policy to another so that the party, the, 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 the principle and policy followed by party A will change entirely. And the curriculum vitae will change, uh, will change co completely. Like uh, before now, we have history. Sir, in the, in just the, ask the question. That, uh, the, uh, can there be any consistency in policy so right. that the education can, can be... Uh, okay, that, 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 consistency that. in policy. Yes, ma. I'm Dr. Larry Sawyer. All protocols duly observed. Congratulations, Daddy. Uh, my, question, uh, my problem has to do with the conditions of service. I'm not talking about salary now, but the environment where teachers see, teach in our secondary schools and primary schools are nothing to write home about. There are not situations that can make any good person perform to the, to the best of his or her ability. I remember when I was in the primary school in Lagos. Things were done like as if we are in a European country. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask that my able professor should assist in looking into the conditions and welfare of teachers in our primary, secondary, and some tertiary institutions. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sir. I want to take, a, for gender balance, another female from that side, if there is another female from that side. A female from that side. Okay. A female. Hey. Papa, well done for the job you've been doing for the years past. More grease to your body. More life. You just started your new life anyway. Now my question is this. Oh, I'm a retired civil servant, but not yet tired. I was an inspector to schools in all your state. Not only to your state, you really the western state. Now I want to know precisely whether the Ministry of Education I still continue to inspect schools and spot inspections and not routine inspection. Because when you continue with your routine inspection, you go on window shopping. Spot me, All right, you will be the on time All right. to catch the schools. All right, and they are active. I want to know why. Secondly or lastly, do they carry on with aim? update it and how to evaluate the puppies and the teachers as well. All right, well. ma. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, chairman and uh, our daddy, the celebrant, and our mommy, we'd like to thank you all. Uh, I, I, apparently, uh, we can see many more people who want to ask questions. But I'd like to uh, plead with all of those people who want to ask questions uh, to maybe read the, read the book and it may give some answers to the questions you may be willing to ask. So I would like to apologize most sincerely 
the reason being, I'm going to, I'm up immediately, I'm off immediately to Abuja where the vice chancellors are meeting. So I'd like to apologize most sincerely. Now let me go in the reverse order of the questions. Is Ministry of Education still inspecting the schools? The answer, Mama, is that yes, yes, but no problem. The answer is that they are still inspecting the schools, but all they are going out to do is just collect envelopes from the people. I have, we have studied the quality assurance activities at a basic education level. We have inspectorate or quality assurance departments in all these places, but they are not doing it the way they should do it. They will come to the school, especially the private schools, when the proprietor gives them the envelope, they will not even enter the compound. They will just go back. But I'm not saying absolute, but that's the common practice. So the thing we must do, ma, is to strengthen the leadership of our ministries to ensure that this does not happen and uh, work, uh, <laughs> work out a, a way whereby those inspectorate, mommy, please sit down, ma. Those inspectorate officials, maybe they have not received their salaries and that they are looking for how to, you know, to manage. There's one equation that we derived, and that equation is this. When poverty increases, honesty decreases. So when you are hungry, you are poor, you have school fees to pay, and government has not paid you, and they send you to a school, you quickly want to collect this thing to make that up. But more importantly, as a direct answer to your question, we should all strive towards uh, strengthening the inspectorate or quality assurance departments or units in our ministries at all levels and uh, ensuring that the operators or the officers uh, are not lured to be corrupt. Going up about condition of service, environment, where teachers teach, welfare of teachers, mommy, a few things are happening. Uh, I'm going to mention that a case study and I'd like you to applaud it. Uh, please sit down, ma'am. Chief Dr. Onike Kwakonde is chairing the Oyo State, uh, is it Tertiary Education Trust Fund, ma'am? Oyo Education Trust Fund. And this group is uh, working hard towards improving the environment. They're doing little by little. At, please, please ap 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 applaud, mama, applaud her, her group. They are visiting the schools, taking inventory of what the gaps and renovating. So this example must be copied nationwide. Mr. Dari Babalola, consistency in education. If any concern in policy and implementation, uh, I, will call, I, will, I will speak with God today to answer that question. Because me, I cannot answer it. I cannot answer it because when you, you, Dari Babalola, becomes governor of X state, you will do like the others. There's a bug that buys them. They will come to the place and turn the whole place around. So we we'll continue to pray for them and beg God to let them be consistent. The policies that are good, that they have met, they should keep. Stupendously disturbed. Baba is stupendously, stupendously disturbed. I like that uh, phraseology. No fighters, no battleground. Of course, sir, you describe the battleground. The battleground is what you have described. The parents are not willing to do their work, what they should do. The teachers are compromised. The facilities are, are, are poor. The curriculum, all those things that are listed, that's the battleground. And is it possible to fix, to give at the end of it, the answer to it all? Drawing a line between corruption and, and, uh, and uh, the whatever. I, I didn't quite get the gist of that question. But all, all I want to say is that... Uh, Everybody should apply his or her God-given talents to the service that he or she has been called to do. So the last statement I want to make, 
the key, key to all of this, to winning the battle, is leadership. The key. The master key. The silver bullet that will keep the enemy, keep him or her heart, and win the battle for us is leadership. Leadership at local government level, leadership at state level, leadership at, uh, at federal government level, and leadership in our homes. So, when the basket of blame is being carried, you as parents, don't just push it to local government chairman or push it to the state gov governor or to federal government. You yourself as parents, set your hearts. What have you done as a leader in your home? So the key, ladies and gentlemen, if I was asked to summarize this lecture in one word, how we can win the battle. It's a battle of leadership. Thank you. A round of applause for the guest lecturer. Thank you very much, sir. And that's, we apologize, we won't be able to take more questions because he has to leave now. So we want to do a presentation of the plaque for our guest lecturer, and that will be done by Chief Mrs. Onike Poakade, C-O-N, to present our guest lecturer with his plaque. Put your hands together for him as he stands, and then as Mama is standing. All right, so Your Excellencies, Royal Fathers, Mr. Chairman, the Sally Branch of today, Chief Adibayo Akonde, on behalf of Midland uh, Publications, I present this plaque to our guest lecturer for a well-delivered uh, lecture, very informative. I'm very educated. Professor, we are very grateful to you. Thank you very much. Can we do a round of applause again for our guest lecturer? Professor, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And to present the next Black is Emeritus Professor Ayo Banjo. Put your hands together for him as he steps forward. Prof, please step forward, sir. And he will be presenting the plaque for the chairman of this occasion, Chief Bayo Ujero. Put your hands together for, for them as they step out. Thank you very much, sir. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I think in the course of his uh, address to us at the beginning of this uh, meeting, he has traced back the beginning of uh, our association. And uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to see how Bayo Yero has made his mark in society. And uh, I have very great pleasure in presenting this to him as one who has just finished presiding over an exhilarating uh, lecture on education. I wish you all the very best and more grease, more elbow grease. There we are. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, sir. Let's put a hands together for both of them as they go back to their seat. As they go back to their seat. Very quickly, I'd like to welcome, while we were doing the question time, I saw uh, the representing Lagelu Akinyele Federal Constituency at the House of Representatives, Honorable Olatoye. Tebe Dr. Sugar walked in. Let's appreciate him and give him a round of applause. He's somewhere around there. Welcome, Honorable. Now it's time for us to listen to the vote of thanks. We want to move it before we do the cutting of cakes. I've been asked to move it. Vote of thanks, and then we'll do the cutting of cake. I'd like to call Bayo Akonde Jr., Papa, to do the vote of thanks. Put your hands together for Papa as he steps forward. Your Excellency, the Governor of Oyo State, ably represented by Your Excellency, the Deputy Governor of Oyo State, Chief Moses Adeyemo, your ro our Royal Fathers, High Chief Adebaya Akonde, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of this huge family called West Midlands Communications, let me start by expressing a profound gratitude to God Almighty, who has given us this day the good health and goodwill to be here. He alone deserves all the glory. The guest speaker this year, Professor Peter Okebokola, OFR, has done tremendously well. Great appreciation to the chairman of this occasion, Chief Bayo Oyero. Guests here, drawn from different shades, sectors, and interests, you are all appreciated indeed. To my colleagues at Splash and Lagelu FM stations, you are in To our loyal listeners all over the world, we pledge our unflinching commitment towards good quality content and will continue to positively impact the society. We remain grateful to our esteemed customers who keep our business afloat. We assure you of great value for your money always. As a family, the Akonde is we today wish our patriarch, High Chief Adebayo Akonde, MFR, Maye Olupado of Ibadoland, <laughs> Maye, excuse me, <laughs> a blissful 79th birthday. <laughs> As you continue to break new grounds in contributing your quota to the great city of Ibado, or your state, Nigeria, and humanity at large, may you receive new strength, new grace, and life more abundance. Thank you. All right. That was Papa. Put your hands together for Papa there. Okay. I know I've been told that some people want to present gifts for Baba, the, our chairman. Let's quickly do that before we do the cutting of cake and end the program. So if, you, if there's a group that wants to present a gift for Baba, please step forward. I know Odin Lade says he wants to present an artwork. If you are coming, just let me know the name, and then I'll announce it. Please just gift, if it's a gift, please just come and present your gift to Baba, as he's seated there, right there. Yes. That's National Council of Women's Society. Are you going to do this in one minute? I know it's a minute. Papa... We appreciate the work you'll be doing for the nation with long life and prosperity. From National Council of Women's Society of Ibado here, presented to you and donated by a loving president, Mrs. Ashimololu. She's so lovely to her. She love all the women this day and she's doing a beautiful work. So for your own merit of excellence, we presented these things to you, sir, with long life and prosperity. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.
All right. Um, the head of the department of sociology, department University of Ibadan, sir. It's, it's your turn. The chair, sir. Uh, the celebrant, sir. Uh, my name is Professor Ifan Yonor, the head of the Department of Sociology, University of Ibadan. We are here, I'm here on behalf of the department and on behalf of the staff and students of that department to appreciate you, sir, for your kind gesture to the department, with particular reference to funding uh, programs with, you know, some millions. We are quite appreciative, and we want to say on this occasion, may the Lord God Almighty keep you, preserve you, to continue the good work you're doing in our society. Amen. And quickly, we want to the Odunlade, the artist, to please step forward and do his presentation very quickly. He said he has original artwork for Baba, and our guest lecturer, but he's gone. Bokia i Baba mi yami egbo mi ataburo mi. I like to present this piece of artwork, which is one of my original works of art, to the celebrant today. In part because I've enjoyed uh, a lot of what he has established here in Ibadan. I've been interviewed on uh, Splash FM uh, on Edmund Obilo's program severally, and I want to sh give him this as a way of saying thank you very much. The title of the work is called Mother Nature. Um, it takes quite a large art to be able to do something for the public, and then you're not really expecting any gain, if it comes, fine. If it doesn't, which I believe is the spirit behind uh, Chief Akade's uh, uh, modus operandi. Thank you very much, everybody. That was Odunlade there for his presentation. Please, can we please move? Oh, yeah. This artwork has been exhibited in the Smithsonian uh, institution, National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., and in fact, is a limited edition of 20 that the one over 20 is right in the collection of the museum. So he's getting, I think, the number 10 over 20. It's numbered. So uh, thank you. The second one, without wasting time, is uh, to the guest lecturer. No, no, no. Like this. It's to the guest lecturer. And this one is titled, The Valued uh, Professor. Uh, uh, the message in it is that um, the town and the gown are supposed to work together. And with what I've seen him doing over time, he has been able to demonstrate that the town is an integral part of the gown, while the gown is also an integral part of the town. So that's why I'm presenting this to Professor Kebukola. It's been the last 17 years since I've been looking to meet him because somebody had introduced me to him. I never had the opportunity of meeting him until today. So on his way out just now, I told him that I have this piece for him and uh, he's coming back to my studio in the next couple of weeks to take this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next thing is to do the cutting of cake right now. And so we want to do the cutting of cake. Please, can you help me put the cake here uh, so that we can do that? And I'd like to invite our chairman alongside with uh, our mommy and the deputy governor, Your Excellency, sir, to please join the chairman at the cake stand as we come to cut the cake. Uh, it's being put at the center. Yes, sir, Your Excellency, sir. <laughs> 